All right, we're on the record on 17 CR 343. We're scheduled for sentencing. Uh, the rules in the courtroom are that everyone is going to wear a mask unless they're speaking on the record. If they want to remove their mask to speak on the record, I prefer it. But it's not going to be required unless we can't understand somebody, particularly the reporter. So with that, Mr. Champagne, uh, did you want to respond to the motion that was filed Wednesday morning? Your Honor, uh, we uh, reserve a response. Uh, if the court wants to uh, have us brief the issue, we're more than happy to do so. I do have some brief comments in my closing statement on the issue of merger and that motion, um, but I don't have a formal response prepared at this time. All right. All right. Uh, I will um, at some point rule on the on the what you raised, Mr. Moran, and if it ends up that I don't rule on it. Uh, today I will rule out a prior to issuing the minimus, so there's no, there won't be any prejudice to your side. So, with that, Mr. Uh, Champagne, are you ready for sentencing? Yes, Your Honor. And Mr. Moran, are you ready? Yes, thank you. Okay. I want to let everybody know that uh, anyone, particularly people coming to speak uh, at the sentencing, uh, needs to speak loudly, slowly, mm -hmm. and you need to talk into the microphones. So, Mr. Moran, in addition to yourself and Mr. Redwine, do you have anybody who wants to speak at sentencing? No, you're on. No, thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, Mr. Champagne, do you have anyone? Yes, Your Honor. And who would that be? Elaine Hall, Corey Redwine, Brandon Redwine, and the prosecution team. Well, you'll get your chance. Uh, who wants to go first? People would bring forward Elaine Hall. Ms. Hall, come on up to the lectern, please. And this is your chance to tell me what you want to tell me. So whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Can you hear me? I can. I'm really nervous, so it's okay. bear with me. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I appreciate it. Obviously, when I say you, I'm not referring to you. Um, this is all directed at Mr. Redwine. Um, as I stand here today, I think about what has transpired in the last nine years and all the heartbreak and unknowing and hope and everything else that we have lived through. And I can't help but go back to one person and that is Mr. Redwine. We obviously did not see eye to eye on many things, which is obviously why our marriage didn't work, but I never thought that he would take out his frustration that he had with the family on Dylan. But then I think about it, he always picks on the weakest, so it totally makes sense. Um, Dylan was 13 years old when he took his life. He had his whole life ahead of him to make major accomplishments, and you know he would have done it, and he would have done it well. Um, you robbed him of his youth. You robbed him of what he would have been, and you did all that to put him in the mountains where animals could scavenge his bones. You had no remorse, no regret. You never take accountability for any of your actions. You never have and you never will. So whatever I say at this moment is not going to resonate. It is going to go in one ear and out the other, just like everything else in this trial. It's very frustrating to me that you never take accountability. It's also very frustrating to me with what you put our family through and what you put this community through, you knew where Dylan was the whole time we were looking for him. And not once did you offer up any advice or any suggestion as to where he would be. The night that you hurt Dylan, you should have done the right thing and called 911 and let them figure it out instead of taking his body and letting him be scavenged on a mountain. 
When I think about what happened that night, it breaks my heart to think about Dylan looking up at his dad knowing he's the killer. He is my killer. It breaks my heart. And I wonder, what were you thinking then when you saw his big old blue eyes? I, I, I mean, I don't even think that it phased you, which is why you really need to have the maximum sentence because you have a lot of soul searching to do and a lot of forgiveness to get from people and you need to learn to forgive yourself for so many mistakes you have made over the years. Um, the selfishness, the control, the emotional abuse, the mental abuse that we have suffered under your reign is no more for us anymore. Once this is done, you're out of my life, and I'm very happy about that. I don't know what will happen to you, and quite frankly, whatever happens to you, you did to yourself. You could have lived a good life. There's a lot of good things that still happen. You will never meet your, your biological grandchildren. I, I mean, there's so much you gave up. And then you, 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 you say that the trial was a sham and that you, you always stood up for or you always had remorse when you did something wrong. No, that's not true. You never had remorse. You still don't have remorse. You, you are always, have always been worried about yourself and you continue to worry about yourself. So I hope you take the time to really think about, you know, what, what, what you have done with your life and how many people you hurt. Because the day you took Dylan, you also, in many respects, took my mother because she died of a broken heart from missing Dylan. Thanksgiving holiday, all these people are out looking for Dylan. You're nowhere to be found. They, they, they invested their time and energy and money in looking for our son when you knew where he was. So with that, you know, I, I, I could say so much more, but like I said, it, it's not going to change anything. I'm just glad that we are free from you and that you will not be free to hurt us anymore. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Mr. Champagne. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the people call forward Brandon Redwine. Mm -hmm. All right, come on up, Mr. Redwine. And whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. I want to thank the court for allowing this moment to obviously voice my thoughts to the court. And I want to make it very clear that with what I'm saying is, is reflective of kind of what we went through for nine years trying to figure out what happened. And some of the frustration that was caused by Mark just not taking any responsibility. So, Mr. Redwine, I want you to know that your actions alone have led you to this moment. Your actions have made it so you will never see your drink. You will never be a meaningful part of my life either. Here are some of the things that are important for me to let you know. I hope that one day you can take responsibility for what you did to Dylan. I hope that you are not too proud to ask for forgiveness. I hope that you recognize that this is not Elaine's fault, nor is it my mom's fault. I hope that you understand that you have taught me how to be a better man. I saw your physicality with my mom and your absence from my life. And that taught me what not to do. I also hope that you will you see that you will never be called dad. I have Juice. Corey has Mike. Mark changed his name from yours, and we know what happened with Dylan. And that is all your responsibility, Mark. I hope you recognize and take accountability for what you've done. So. All right. Thank you. The people call forward Corey Redwine. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Redwine.
Thank you for the opportunity to speak. The past nine years without Dylan have been nothing short of misery. It's hard for me to speak in front of you today and say I have been victimized when I think of what Dylan went through. The more I think about what has happened, the more I understand how Mark's actions have made me a victim. What did I and Dylan do to deserve this? We looked up to Mark and have always tried to make him proud. I also think of the addiction to alcohol I have relied on so much through these years. What could I have done differently to keep Dylan away from the evil that consumes Mark? I think about our differences and how I could have also been in the same position as Dylan. <clears throat> While my kids will never meet Dylan or their real grandfather, I often think of what I could have done differently as the older brother who was also raised in fear. See, I can't change the hate in Mark's heart, and I can't blame myself for his mistakes. I can only learn from them. I can't bring Dylan back. I can only remember him. I can't talk to Dylan, so I pray to him. And I can't see Dylan, so I dream of him. Mark may have physically taken him, and I can't change that. But what I can do is tell the world how a 13-year-old young man stood up to his then 50-year-old father and said all the things I regret never saying. Dylan is my hero and became more of a man in 13 years than Mark has in 60. I'm so proud of Dylan and what he stood for. I'm sorry for the beautiful woman who will never share his love and for the people who will never share his common love for all. It inspires me that Dylan's actions over the course of his life are what will be remembered and not Mark's words and his lies. Dylan's name will run through our family forever and his stories will be shared by all who loved him. Mark's name will no longer have meaning to all those who loved him and will be replaced with whatever is left in his heart. Mark has always told me, or Mark always told me as a kid, be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. His selfish ways have caught up with him and he got exactly that himself. He also said no one will ever love you like you real dad, but like much of the past nine years, that too was a lie. Mike is our dad, not because he must be, but because he wants to be. He has treated Dylan and I as if we were his own kids. My kids love their papa, and he loves them. He picks up the slack not only when they see their uncle on TV all the time and can't meet him, but also celebrate all of their accomplishments. I wish I could be proud to have Mark as my father, as is Dylan, but instead I'm writing a painful part of my life that stays with him. I can no longer carry the Mark's burden like I did as a child, filling the pair of shoes he left when he left us. That's on Mark. Some things are worse than death, and living with the choices he has made is now his own responsibility and no longer ours. There's a long walk alone into a place that only a convicted killer can understand, and that's what's in his mind, and that's all that's left. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Redwin. Does that take care of your side then, Mr. Champagne? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Moran, uh, the pre-sentence report indicates uh, pre-trial confinement credit of 1,517 days. Uh, do you agree with that calculation? No. What do you think it is? Mr. Redwine was arrested on July 25, 2017. Mm -hmm. Pre-sentence report talks about his arrest being August 14, 2017 approximately three weeks difference in the calculation. As it should be versus what was put in the pre-sentence report, I believe that his pre-sentence confinement credit time is moment please. Go ahead. Take your time. One thousand five hundred forty days. The pre-sentence confinement credit noted on the adult sentence report. The second line of the report says one thousand five hundred seventeen. We're obviously concerned when the second line of the pre-sentence report contains an error of this prejudice. 
Well, do you believe it's 1540? Is that what you think it is? Counting today, I believe it's 1540, yes. Mr. Champagne, do you have any problem with that? No, Your Honor. All right. All right, Mr. Moran. I, I beg your pardon. I said July 25th. It's July 22nd. All right, thank you. And hey, Mr. Moran, did you want to make a sentencing argument? Your Honor, there's a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, consistent with the motion that we filed, Sense 194, with respect to the, the sentencing requirements of 181408, Mr. Champagne has mentioned that he believes it to be a merger situation. In, in that event, I think under 181408, subsection 1, the court must vacate one of the convictions. Um, I've outlined in my motion which charge we believe or which conviction needs to be vacated. Based on Colorado law, um, that obviously impacts whether we are arguing about a sentence of 16 to 48 or up to 96 years. So, Well, it does not because I am of the opinion uh, that uh, they have to keep the sentences even if there's two convictions have to be run concurrently. I take it that's because your, your Honor is finding identical facts supporting each conviction. Because uh, of the law, and it's because of uh, what I heard at the trial. I understood your Honor to re remark that there will be a written order that we can expect on there, this issue. There will probably be a short written order that I'll do after sentencing today. As a housekeeping and could matter. You, could you speak at the lectern, please? Sure. As a housekeeping matter, we'd also uh, request that the court sign the inform of operic. I haven't seen that. Did that get filed today? It was filed, I believe, Wednesday. I haven't seen it, but uh, if it doesn't get filed today, um, or signed today, excuse me, uh, get in touch with me next week. I'll, you definitely, uh, that needs to happen. Again, as a housekeeping matter, I searched and was unable to find a victim impact statement. I'd ask that the court inquire of the prosecution whether one was completed by the district attorney's office as required under 1611-102. Mr. Champagne, uh, I don't remember seeing one either. Judge, if you'll give me a moment, I can look into it. We do not have one on file, Your Honor. So you're not seeking any restitution then? We're asking for restitution to remain open for 91 days. Um, on both scores, we'll object. The law in the state of Colorado requires the district attorney's office to prepare a victim impact statement. One has not been provided. The site for that mandatory provision that um, should have been completed by one of the three district attorney's offices Handling this matter um, is the site on this is 1611-102-1A, Roman numeral three. The mandatory provision of uh, that statute indicates to me that we're not in a position to move forward with the sentencing. Um, that's something that's required to have been provided well before today. And in fact, the and when did you uh, notice this? Yesterday. Well. You're just as dilatory as they are. We're going to go forward. What else do you want to say? Uh, that that information was necessary and to have been provided early on in the case. There's also a house, the housekeeping matter of a motion we filed in November of 2020. That was a motion filed about investigation that had been done about potential jurors by the sheriff's office. I want to make sure that this court has the Excel spreadsheet with all of the information about those citizens who have been called for jury duty. I think it was provided to the court in a November 4th, 2020 filing from the prosecution, and I believe that was requested by Your Honor. I just, we're not able to access it in ISIS, and before there's any sort of loss of jurisdiction in this court, I want to make sure that that exhibit has been provided. The November 4th, 2020 filing is called Juror Alpha List, Uncontested Responsive Documents to SDT. So I'd inquire of the prosecution whether that is, in fact, the Excel spreadsheet 
document prepared by the sheriff's office um, with the information about potential jurors on it. If, if that's not it, I do have a copy that I can provide to the court. We're obviously very sensitive to the material that's in that Excel spreadsheet, and we don't want to provide it without explicit direction from the court so that we can make sure uh, that that private information is protected, at least for my. Well, you know, there's been over a thousand filings in this this case, maybe two thousand. I don't remember exactly how many. I have no idea. Uh, this is something we can deal with later. Mr. Champagne, are you aware whether or not something filed back in November is actually in the court, was filed with the court? Your Honor, uh, that spreadsheet was provided to defense counsel. I believe they attached it as an exhibit to their motion. Um, well, if it was attached as an exhibit to your motion, it's part of the file. If it wasn't attached as an exhibit, you can file it under seal and it'll go up as part of the record. Thank you, Your Honor. And we've got that on a disc. Is that how Your Honor would prefer that we provide it to you? I don't know. I doubt it. I'll have to talk to the clerks. We'll follow up on that. Um, the statute requiring an advisement given to veterans wasn't on the books until August of 2018, but 16.7207.5 describes this court's duty to inform defendants with current or prior military service on their first appearance or upon a plea of guilty of certain rights they have um, that has not been done. I would ask of the court that that advisement be provided before it's too late. I think today's the day. Well, again, you know, you're throwing stuff at me at the last second. It makes it very difficult for me to do. Uh, was Mr. Redwine, is Mr. Redwine a veteran? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Um, I don't have that advisement in front of me right now. Uh, I will provide it. Well, tell me what it is, Mr. Mr. Moran. The statutory side on this is 16. No, tell me what the advisement is. You tell me what the advisement is. And Mr. Redwine, listen up. Colorado Revised Statute 16.7.207.5 is a, a mandatory provision requiring the court to inform defendants um, at, at their first appearance uh, of certain matters. Subsection 1 reads, at the first appearance of defendants in court or upon arraignment, as I am confident this court is aware, um, whichever is first in time, the court shall ascertain whether the defendant is serving in the United States Armed Forces or is a veteran of such forces. The court shall inform any such defendant that the defendant may be entitled to receive mental health treatment, substance use disorder treatment, or other services as a veteran. That's the advisement I'm talking about. All right. Mr. Redwine, did you hear that? I did hear it. So you're aware of it? I am, Your Honor. Thank you very much. What else, Mr. Moran? There are problems with the PSI. We've gone over the uh, issue with respect to credit for time served it brings me no joy to have to take issue with the, the PSI. Our preference would have been to make very short record um, here, but unfortunately under the People v. Smalley case, that's 369 Pacific 3rd, 737 Colorado Court of Appeals from 2015. The court is stressing the requirement for contemporaneous objections. Otherwise, the issue is not preserved because the trial court loses a meaningful chance to prevent or correct the error. That's why we bring to the court's attention the lack of victim impact statement, a responsibility that falls to the prosecution. I would also make note of the fact that silence, Mr. Redwine's decision that because of the pending appeal or the appeal, the appeal that will be pending, uh, he did not want to make any statement to the pre-sentence report writer that that's not something that can be considered aggravating. That's Mitchell v. United States, 526 ES 314. A 1999 Colorado or U.S. Supreme Court case, there's a 
People Be Young in Colorado stands for the same proposition, in, it's improper for a sentencing court to rely on an inferred lack of remorse from defendant's silence as an aggravating circumstance. So just to start off with that, um, I'll let the prosecution correct the possible penalties. They are not accurate in the PSI. The offense summary contains numerous factual errors. Some of those were factual issues that were a controversy between the parties during the trial, but there are other pieces uh, of that summary that are coming from sources that are unknown to us and not in the trial record. We're not stipulating to that summary. The circumstances of victim section that was created by the probation department contain inflammatory and irrelevant statements. The, those statements came in response to questions that, uh, from our perspective, should not have been put to a grieving family. The hatred and anger evidenced in those statements are understandable, but they shouldn't be in PSI. They shouldn't be part of this court's consideration in determining sentence. We're asking to have those remarks stricken. I point the court to page four, line one, second sentence. It's a irrelevant, inflammatory, subjective opinion. Question two, um, the, on page four, question and remark not relevant to this court's sentencing decision under the sentencing provisions of Colorado Revised Statute 18.1, 102.5. Failure to order it stricken gives rise to the specter of the sentence that will be announced here is based on irrelevant and unsubstantiated opinion. Loose canon is subjective and inflammatory. People be Dunlap, 97 Pacific 2nd, 723. The pin site on that is 745, Colorado Supreme Court case from 1999. Detailing Mr. Dunlap's prior conviction or crimes was proper but evidence regarding the perceptions of the victims of those crimes was not. We aim to preserve this issue by bringing it to the court's attention here. The claimed perception of fear is one that would not stand up under cross-examination, which is a necessity if the court's crediting it or basing its sentencing on those remarks. That proposition comes from Crawford v. Washington, 541 U.S. 36, Penn site. 60, page 64, it's a 2004 U.S. Supreme Court decision saying that victim allocutions are testimonial in nature and therefore implicate the Sixth Amendment Confrontation Clause. So again, we're asking the court to strike it and to not rely on it in the sentencing determination. Question three seems to be why there is a recommendation for treatment by probation later in the pre-sentence report. This is a subjective opinion contained in the answer to question three. It's based on stale information. It's concerning that it led to a recommendation by probation for substance abuse intervention. The objective inventory compiled using the adult substance use survey said no treatment was necessary, but probation, I believe, based on the answer to this question, recommended otherwise. The court can see on page seven, Mr. Redwine was not holding back in describing adult use, ignoring the objective measures for the objective opinion of a grieving victim and basing the recommendation of the court on that statement it is concerning to us. Question four asks for an expert opinion. The response is irrelevant and inflammatory, betraying bias based on stale information. We move that it be stricken. Question five talks about things done to, quote, probably many others, it's speculative and irrelevant comments on character, should be stricken as inflammatory and unreliable, again, relying on the Dunlap decision. Question six talks about current concerns of substance abuse. It borders on absurdity. If the source was not an upset person, so we can understand where it's coming from, but probation determined a detest for drugs was not necessary because Mr. Redwine is in jail. Any suggestion of current chemical substance use would not, would not stand up to the confrontation requirement under Crawford. We ask that it be stricken. A defendant's rights under due process clause are denied if the sentencing court relies upon facts that are demonstrably false. 
that proposition comes from the People v. Porat case, it's P-O-U-R-A-T. That's a Colorado Court of Appeals decision from 2004. The site for that is 100, the third, 503. We incorporate the arguments just listed as to the first six or seven questions for the irrelevant and inflammatory remarks that come in the next section. I won't belabor that any further. Criminal history section of the PSI says, Mr. Redwine, let me put it this way. Mr. Redwine has no history more significant than a class three misdemeanor from what we can see on there. The one exception to that might be a misdemeanor trespass from North Carolina. I'm not familiar with their criminal code, but what I'm told about what happened there, and it's obvious from the date Mr. Redwine graduated high school, that he was still a high school student. It was a party he and his brother threw at the house. They were hot water with mom and dad. When Mr. Redwine went back to get things from his house, the neighbors called law enforcement. It was an unfortunate event, one he acknowledged responsibility for. It stands out that with his minimal criminal history, he pleaded guilty, acknowledged responsibility, and all of those where it was appropriate. The theft noted was a folding table he didn't return to a grumpy former employer. The driving offense was because of the name of the business he was working for had not been printed on the side of the truck's door. The family background section of the PSI is taken entirely from statements Mr. Redwine made on some PSI paperwork. There was no investigation. The law on this is that the probation officer shall make an investigation. That's Colorado Revised Statute 1611-1021A. There's also a Colorado case on that. It's Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T, 672 Pacific 2nd, Penn Site 521. So where there's a waiver of information that is to be derived and considered by the court, where it's waived by the court and determined to be not necessary, the court needs to make a record about why the waiver is acceptable according to the Colorado Supreme Court and people v. Valencia, V-A-L-E-N-C-I-A, 906 Pacific 2nd, 115, Penn Site 116. We're asking the court to make the record as to why the following is based solely on the statements of Mr. Redwine and not on any further investigation and how that is acceptable in PSI for this court. The information as to the defendant's family background came strictly from comments he made. It is not an investigation that is supposed to be based entirely on self-report. Same holds true for educational history. Employment record, which we believe to be important because Mr. Redwine, as Your Honor is aware, having been dealing with this case for years, was employed gainfully throughout the majority of his adult life except for when he was raising children. He made good money. He was in supervisory roles. The information on the PSI appears to have come perhaps from the CPAT. The information was easily available in discovery or just in speaking with Mr. Champagne's office under People v. Martinez, 32 Pacific 3rd, 520, Colorado Court of Appeals case from 2001. Any waiver of the requirement of investigation on this issue is something for which there should be a record that we request it. No mental health information was provided. It talks about how screening does not put him at an intensive level of probation, but probation recommends prison. Even though they believed probation to have been available, the PSI also says that he needs treatment, even though the ACEs are testing that he does not. The lack of investigation conducted reliance on personal inventory errors in the PSI created constitutionally infirm prejudice. And to Mr. Redwine, the court should not put stock in this document. It contains subjective impressions that reveal more the bias of the local department and otherwise than it does information relevant under Section 18.1, 102.5. So those are our issues with the PSI with respect to comments prior to sentencing from the defense. I would say simply that Mr. Redwine loved Dylan. Oh, hold on. 
In terms of your objections to the pre-sentence report, um, well, it's understandable uh, that there uh, was no cooperation by the defense with the pre-sentence report because the appeal is pending and Mr. Redwine has a right to remain silent. That certainly affected their ability to do the normal investigation that they do. Uh, the motion to strike uh, is denied, or the motions to strike are denied. The um, court uh, questions the interpretations of some of the case law, some of it I obviously haven't read, because I've never heard of it before. But the court wants to state that this decision that's going to be made is not going to be based on the pre-sentence report. It's going to be based upon what I've seen in the courtroom, pre-trial motions, the trial, and um, well, that's what the court is basing the decision on. So with that, you can make your sentencing argument. To repeat. Mr. Redwine loved Dylan with all of his heart. The depth of grief Dylan's loved ones have experienced may never leave a high water mark. Hopefully there is some comfort to them found in the expression of hurt and anger, anger these proceedings have epitomized. Mr. Redwine is eager for fair and impartial review by a higher court. He is appealing and wishes to make no further record here. All right. Mr. Champagne. Thank you, Your Honor. One brief matter. Um, defense counsel uh, expressed concern regarding the lack of a victim impact statement and cited 1611-1021A. Uh, upon further review, that statute details uh, the requirements of the probation department in the PSI. And part of the requirements of the PSI is that they reach out to the victim to obtain a victim impact statement. Um, that has occurred in this case and is part of the PSI. The statements of Elaine Hall are contained therein. Uh, and uh, as such, there is no violation of 1611-102, um, nor at any action of the district attorney's office on that matter. That, that's mistaken. You know what? You're not talking right now. Sit down. Go ahead. Thank you, Judge. Your Honor, um, I've got some statements that I prepared that I'd like to read to the court. I'm also going to invite my co-counsel, Fred Johnson and Michael Doherty, to come forward and make some statements, uh, and then I'll wrap up at the end if that pleases the court. Go ahead. Thank you. You've, Your Honor, you have presided over this case from the very beginning, and as you just noted, You've seen it from the earliest days of the investigation. Watch as the community searched for Dylan, hoping against hope that he was still alive. You've seen the case progress over time, from the sad day that Dylan's remains were found on the side of Middle Mountain, to the indictment of Mark Redwine by the grand jury. You presided over the motions hearings, watched the evidence develop, and the parties prepared their cases for trial. And you heard every day of the five-week trial culminating in Mark Redwine's conviction for the murder of his son, Dylan. You have all the facts, details, and information you need to hand down the right sentence in this case, the maximum sentence under the law, the full 48 years in prison. But I wanna emphasize some things for you as we proceed through the sentencing hearing. I wanna speak about the impact that this has had on his family, how the behavior of Mark Redwine that led up to the brutal murder of Dylan and that his behavior afterwards exponentially increased the suffering of Dylan's family and this entire community. But first, I want to talk to you about Dylan and what his loss means for all of us. Your Honor, I've worked this case from the very beginning. And over these last nine years, I feel like I've gotten a glimpse into Dylan through the words and emotions of his family and friends, their stories about his behavior, their relationships with him, and their time with him during his young life. I know that his family misses him every single day. His mother Elaine, brother Corey, and stepdad Mike all miss him every single day. They all knew how special he was, his true potential, and how great he could be. They believed in him. They believed in the beauty that he could bring into this world. 
He was a young man who shone brightly, just starting the prime of his life as he grew from adolescence into adulthood. He was precocious and smart and full of life. He never met a stranger, and he could fill up the room with his vibrance and liveliness. He put a smile on everyone's face and filled them with light and happiness, and he connected with everyone around him. And people felt connected to him. People loved him. They loved him for the character that he was, and he was quite a character by all accounts. An earnest young man who wore his emotions on his sleeve for the world to see. People say that when he loved you, he loved you with everything that he had. When he was being a rascal, he did it with a fun-loving heart. And when he was confused or frustrated or angry with the world around him, he let everyone know. His bond with his brother, Corey, was beyond close. They shared everything. And Corey was a trusted confidant with whom he could share his deepest feelings. Questions about growing up, about life, about how to navigate this topsy-turvy world, he went to Corey. When things came up that he couldn't talk to his mother about, the hard stuff, he went to Corey. When he had the toughest times dealing with his dad, he went to Corey. Because he knew he could trust Corey, and Corey would help him and guide him, and he understood what Dylan was going through. He knew Dylan like no other person on the face of this earth, and their bond went beyond mere brotherhood. It was a deep admiration and respect and love that most of us can only wish for. Mike Hall, his stepfather, was a trusted role model and father figure for Dylan. As Dylan grew and began to understand that his real father was a deeply flawed man, he looked to Mike for inspiration about what a man should be. Honest and loving yet firm, he understood how to walk that fine line as a stepfather, seeing that Dylan needed structure and discipline but also needed a safe place to bring his tough questions and someone he could go to as a reliable, trusted adult. Mike was that rock for Dylan, solid ground in what was sometimes a swirling sea. And of course, Elaine, his mother. Their relationship really cannot be put into words. Dylan and Elaine shared a special bond that can only exist between a mother and a son. Deep, deep love and trust. Dylan knew that she would always be there for him, always take care of him when he needed her, no matter what, to nurture him in his times of trouble with a big hug, or just listen if he needed to talk, to keep him in line when he strayed, and to call him out when he needed it, always knowing it came from a place of love and with his best interest at heart. She was the one who took the reins when things got crazy and guided him through the tough times. She always had a plan, a way to get through the challenges to keep him safe and make sure he had everything he needed in this world. She was there for him, to protect him and keep him safe, to nurture and guide him, to help him grow into the man that everyone knew he could be. And what she wouldn't give for one more chance to hug him and tell him how much she loved him. What they all wouldn't give to see him one more time, to see his smile, the sparkle in his eyes, his laugh, to hear his voice, see his face, feel his embrace, to hear him say, I love you to each and every one of them one more time, and have the chance to tell him how much they loved him and missed him every single day. But that was stolen from them, stolen from Dylan, stolen by this man, Dylan's father, the one who was supposed to be there for him, the one who was supposed to love him and nurture him, the one who was supposed to protect him and keep him safe. Instead, he took Dylan's life. He stole it from him, he stole it from his family. And as a result, they will never get to see Dylan's life unfold, to see the special moments, to watch him grow, 
go off to college, fall in love, have children of his own, they'll never get to see the man that Dylan could have become. Instead, this man caused Dylan's death in a heinous and brutal act of violence. He knowingly murdered his own son. He violated the sacred trust that is the highest duty of every parent to protect your child at all costs. He committed the most unforgivable crime in our society, the murder of a child, his own child. And for that, he deserves the fullest measure of justice this court can hand down under the law. 48 years in prison and nothing less. But it's not just the simple, terrible fact that he killed his own son and robbed the world of that beautiful, bright light. This crime is aggravated on so many levels. At every turn, at every opportunity, Mark Redwine has maximized and prolonged the suffering of everyone involved in this case, especially Dylan's family, but also this whole community. From the heinous and ghoulish acts immediately following Dylan's death, Dylan's death to his cowardly efforts to hide the truth and actively sabotage this investigation, to his continual blame of others and refusal to accept responsibility, to his cold-hearted lack of remorse. Mark Redwine has exponentially exacerbated the harm and pain inflicted by his actions on Dylan's family and on this entire community. To understand the impacts of this crime, we have to understand the context of the crime. In the years after their separation and divorce, Mark Redwine became obsessed with his hatred for Elaine Hall. We heard testimony about the bitterness of their divorce the acrimony he felt toward Elaine, but that really doesn't do it justice. This was an almost pathological hatred, and Mark Redwine looked for every way he could to cause her to suffer. First, it was the property disputes arising from their divorce, fighting at every turn to make her suffer. When that was finally settled, he turned to custody over Dylan as the battleground and at every turn and through every avenue he could think of, he sought to extract suffering from Elaine Hall and to try to steal custody of Dylan away from her. Never mind the fact that he was gone for work, spending months of time out in the oil fields, not in a position to be a good father, utilizing almost none of his parenting time. But this wasn't about spending time with Dylan. He could do that whenever he wanted. This was about making sure that she suffered, that she felt pain. And he knew that nothing could hurt her more than losing one of her children. And so that's where he directed all of his fury, attacking her to the child family investigator, attacking her to the court, filing contempt, com contempt pleading after contempt pleading against her. We see Mark also attempting to woo Dylan to his side trying to win her, him over, buying him expensive things, taking him on trips, filling up his bank account with more money than any 13-year-old should ever have. We see him forming a plan that he thought would culminate in the custody hearing on September of 2012, where Dylan would affirmatively state that he wanted to live with him instead of Elaine. But that's not what happened. Because when Dylan went into chambers that day, he didn't choose his dad. He chose his mom and his brother, Corey, and his stepdad, Mike. And despite all of his efforts, his years-long campaign to turn the court against the lane and to turn Dylan against the lane, when the moment of truth came, Dylan chose Elaine over him. In Mark's mind, Elaine had brainwashed Dylan against him tricked him into choosing her over him. Mark believed that Elaine had poisoned Corey against him earlier, and now she had poisoned Dylan against him too. And this drove his hatred for her to new heights. In reality, Dylan had become disillusioned with Mark 
but because of Mark's own actions, not Elaine's. Dylan had come to learn that Mark was not the man he thought he was, not the role model he wanted to follow. And he was constantly bad-mouthing and disparaging the people Dylan loved most in the world, Corey and Elaine. Mark was trying constantly to turn Dylan against them, and he resented Mark for it. This is the context of Dylan's visit on November 18th, 2012. This is the true story of what Dylan was walking into when he got off that plane. Dylan didn't want to be there. He was done with his dad, hadn't spoken to him in months, and wanted nothing to do with him. You can see the disdain he felt towards his father immediately after his arrival. The distances he kept between them, the coldness of his interactions. From the moment he got off the plane, no hugs, no happy reunion, no smiles. Instead, the first thing he did is ask to get away from his father as quickly as he could to sleep over at his friend Ryan Nava's house. This is the tension that Mr. Doherty spoke about so eloquently in his closing argument, and you can feel it when you review the evidence. It's palpable. And after a few short hours, Dylan was gone, murdered at the hands of this man. The harm that Mark Redwine inflicted on his own child, his own family, and this community can never be understated. He stole this bright, beautiful, beautiful boy's life from him and from us all. But, Your Honor, that's only the beginning of the terrible acts that Mark Redwine perpetrated. And in the aftermath of Dylan's brutal murder, we see what Mark Redwine is truly made of, the person that he truly is. Mark Redwine killed Dylan in an unspeakable act of violence, knowingly murdered him. Dylan's skull bore a fracture so powerful and severe it would have killed him. But then Mark Redwine committed an act so truly evil it cannot be spoken but we must speak it. As Dylan lay there dying at the hands of Mark Redwine, he executed a plan so callous and brazen as to be beyond understanding. A plan he had conceived of years earlier, the exact same plan that he described to his first wife, Betsy Horvath, when he was married to her. Years earlier, he told her what he would do if he ever had to get rid of a body. He told her he would find some remote place in the mountains, somewhere no one would ever find it, and let the wild animals feed on the remains until there was no evidence left. And that's exactly what he did to Dylan. Only an unspeakable evil deep within a person could ever conceive of such a plan, much less execute such a plan with his own child's body. He took Dylan, his beautiful boy, up the side of Middle Mountain in his Dodge truck to a place he thought no one would ever find him. And he dumped his body like a piece of trash, hidden in a place where only the animals of the wild would find him and let them feed on his poor child's dead body until almost all of him was gone. But that's not all. He took Dylan's head and he removed it from the rest of the remains and he moved it to an entirely different place on the mountain in a desperate hope that no one would ever find it, knowing that if they did, they could identify it as Dylan's and link the murder back to him. Your Honor, these facts are beyond dispute. The jury has spoken in a clear and unmistakable, unified voice. This man is guilty of these acts. It's proven beyond a reasonable doubt. They're no longer in dispute. Why would someone ever do such a thing? He did this all to hide the terrible truth of what he had done and to save his own skin. This unholy act of desecration of Dylan's remains is so outrageous and repugnant that it is almost beyond belief. But this is exactly what the evidence shows. And we must speak the truth of what happened to Dylan 
so that we may know the measure of this man and therefore the sentence he deserves for what he has done, the maximum sentence. Hiding Dylan's body there on the mountainside, he tried to hide the truth from all of us. And in doing so, he exponentially increased the suffering of Dylan's family and of our whole community. As Elaine stated earlier, when the time came to tell the truth about what happened, to own up and take responsibility, he lied. He lied to us all over and over again, fabricating story after story about Dylan's disappearance. He led us all to believe that Dylan had simply disappeared, vanished from Viacito without a trace. He gave interviews to the news, to the media, to the police, telling the same rehearsed and polished story again and again and again. A story that led away from him and what he had done and out into the great unknown. He watched as searchers searched deep into the night, combing the mountains around his house, looking for any trace of Dylan. He watched as dive teams dragged the lake at Viacito, as helicopters circled overhead looking for the lost boy. He pleaded with the community to come and help, and we did. Hundreds of concerned people came forward to help, dedicating countless exhausting hours looking for Dylan, giving everything they could to find Dylan and bring him home. And he watched as a broken and shattered family assembled in Viacito to face everyone's worst nightmare. Dylan was missing and no one knew where he was. And as all this turmoil swirled and surrounded Mark Redwine, he said nothing and he did nothing. And he knew, he knew exactly where Dylan was, but he said nothing. And by doing so, he inflicted a cruel and awful punishment on them, on all of us. By saying nothing, he led us all to believe that there was hope. Hope that Dylan would show up. Hope that he would come home. Hope that he would be found safe somewhere and come back to our lives and everything would be okay. Night after a sleepless night, Lane and Corey and Mike waited for some news of Dylan, but none came. Law enforcement and professionals and countless volunteers searched endlessly for some clue as to where Dylan was, but they found nothing. And as the days stretched into weeks and into months, they never gave up hope. They never stopped believing that they might find Dylan and bring him home. There's a hellish kind of agony that comes from this sort of hope. It is all consuming and it is exhausting. It is an imperative that no one can ignore, an instinct, an instinct as strong as the will to breathe. A parent can never give up hope they will find their missing child alive. Yet every waiting, every moment waiting for that day is pure hell. And Mark Redwine sat back and watched it all. He let Elaine and Corey and Mike and all of us, this whole community, suffer in this awful purgatory for months and months and months knowing the whole time exactly where Dylan was and exactly what had happened to him. He had the key to end our suffering, but he was too much of a coward to come forward and tell us the truth of what he had done. But it goes beyond that, because instead of just denying involvement and knowledge, he actively misled law enforcement and the investigators, purposely pointing them in the wrong direction in attempts to sabotage them and prevent them from ever finding Dylan's remains. He focused all of their attention on Lake Viacito, knowing that Dylan was on Middle Mountain. He pushed outlandish theories and fed them bogus leads about where Dylan may have gone, then upbraided them for refusing to follow up. And he constantly directed them away from Middle Mountain and argued that Dylan was abducted and secreted out of Viacito entirely, that he was still alive out there somewhere and he sought to manipulate this community. He tried to paint himself as the victim, the grieving father. In countless media interviews, he talked about how much he loved Dylan, how he wanted him home, how he would never give up hope that Dylan would be found alive, and that he just wanted to raise awareness to help find Dylan. 
Your Honor, by hiding the truth, by hiding Dylan from all of us, by actively misleading every effort to find Dylan, he exponentially increased and prolonged the suffering of all those around him. Dylan's mother, his brother, their whole family, our whole community. This aggravates the crime and helps justify the highest sentence this court can impose. But not only did Mark use this awful crime, the murder of his own son, to maximize the amount of suffering possible in every one of us, he actually found a way to weaponize the harm that he had caused against Elaine and her family even more. I spoke to you before about the context of what Dylan walked into, the deep burning hatred that Mark Redwine felt for his ex-wife Elaine Hall. That hatred reached new heights after Dylan's death. And from the beginning of this case, he took every opportunity he could find to blame Elaine, to blame Elaine for Dylan's disappearance and death, a death which he caused. Every time he spoke to law enforcement, he blamed Elaine. Every time he spoke to his confidant, he blamed Elaine. Every time people tried to figure out what happened to Dylan, he blamed Elaine. He crafted outrageous stories to blame her. He argued that she had kidnapped Dylan and she was hiding him from the world to make him look like the bad guy. He said that she stole money that was raised by the supporters of Dylan to try to find him and that she was doing all this for monetary profit. He argued that she had worked with her supporters, people who dedicated countless hours trying to find Dylan, to hide him from the world so that she would have an alibi. He even told people that Dylan tried to escape from her hiding and that she is the one who killed Dylan, her own son, so the world would never know about her evil plot to kidnap him and blame Mark. <clears throat> anything to put Elaine at the center of this terrible tragedy, to paint her as the one who caused Dylan's death. Because in his mind, she was the one who caused Dylan's death. He used his deep hatred of Elaine to absolve himself of what he had done. He found a way to justify his own heinous act. In his mind, it was her fault. She was the one to blame for taking his sweet, innocent boy and poisoning his mind against Mark. She is the one who made him surly and defiant and angry towards him. She was the one who cast a spell over Dylan, and therefore she was the one to blame when Mark lashed out and killed Dylan in that horrible act of violence. In this way, Mark Redwine turned this terrible tragedy into a weapon, a weapon he would wield to try to hurt Elaine over and over and over again as a justification for his own terrible act of murder. At the beginning of this tragedy, we all watched and waited and held our breath that Dylan might be okay. We watched as Mark frantically tried to avoid responsibility, tried to explain why Dylan was gone with stories that didn't make any sense. We watched as he blamed Elaine, blamed strangers, blamed the wild animals. We watched as he blamed everyone when he himself should have taken responsibility for what he did. Instead, we watched as he actively tried to mislead and sabotage the investigation, lied to the police. And we saw that what he was doing didn't make any sense. We wondered why he waited so long to report Dylan missing, why he never went out there to search for Dylan, his missing son. We saw that everyone who knew Mark well, his own family, his own children, quickly came to believe that he was responsible for Dylan's disappearance and death. And we saw that he almost never shed a tear about Dylan being gone. These were not the acts of a grieving father. A grieving father would be out there searching to the ends of the earth for his missing boy until he could search no more. A grieving father would tirelessly demand information from law enforcement and cooperate in every way with any request. A grieving father would stop at nothing to find his missing son. These were not the acts of a grieving father. These were the acts of a cold-blooded murderer. Law enforcement saw through his act. 
they knew. They knew that Mark was at the center of what happened to Dylan, and they never stopped looking, never stopped investigating until they found him, never gave up. And this community never gave up. And the result of their tremendous efforts, they made a miracle happen. They found Dylan. And another, and another miracle, they found Dylan's skull. And as the jury watched and heard the evidence, they saw through his act also. It took them under six hours to return a conviction in this case after a five-week trial. Unanimously guilty to murder in the second degree and child abuse resulting in death. Your Honor, it has been the great privilege of my career to work on this case and to work with the amazing law enforcement team that made this day possible the amazing trial team that secured a conviction in this case. At this time, I would like to ask Mr. Fred Johnson and Mr. Michael Dory to come forward to share their perspective on the sentencing of Mark Redwine. Mr. Johnson. Good morning, Your Honor. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, the family has said so much already, and Mr. Champagne has said so much already that's powerful that I'll try to keep it brief for Your Honor. Uh, as you know, I'm not from town. But when I first came here, this was still an unsolved case uh, about five years ago. And one of the first things that struck me as I came into this community, into this beautiful town, were the flyers that were hung up, Justice for Dylan. One of the first things I did when I came to town was go up to Viacito and saw those flyers. And they were haunting. It's a child's death in a community that's unaccounted for. And it's terrifying. And it has an impact across the entire community, which everyone here knows, and, and I'll talk a little bit about from my outside perspective. But something that I still remember to this day is one of those first uh, images. And it's been an immense impact on this community, um, more than any case I've seen, as much as any case I've seen, I should say. Um, and as unique an impact as Dylan was unique himself. And so one of the things I wanted to talk to the court about are just I see a couple of very aggravating factors here I think the court should consider. But I think there are various perspectives that I've seen from impact on this community that I would ask the court to consider in rendering a sentence here today. Every murder in the second degree is a tragic case. But a child is not an element of that crime. And here, this is a 13-year-old boy with his whole life ahead of him, and a defendant twice his size in a position of trust that murdered him. Someone that should have protected him and loved him, not, not with just with his words that he loved him, talks cheap, the actions leading up, everything he did in his life to create the alienation and his actions on that night. And that's an aggravating factor in this case. And that alone is one of the reasons that this case has been so haunting for the community, that Dylan was a child, that he was completely innocent in this crime. And you don't always see that in a murder in the second degree, but with Dylan, that was absolutely true. And he didn't deserve any of this. And who he was as a victim in his age is an aggravating factor. And as it was already an aggravating factor, um, and that was impacting the community, we come to the night of November 18th where the defendant had a choice. November 18th, 2012. His son was dead. He'd knowingly murdered him. He could have called 911, has been stated. He could have brought his son's body in. He could have allowed him to be laid to rest that night, and this would have been settled. And it wouldn't have had that profound impact on the community that it did for so many years and on his family. And one of the things I think about in this case, and I'd ask you to think about in rendering the sentence, Your Honor, is every night that Dylan's family had to stare at the ceiling at night and wonder what happened to their son. Because it didn't have to be that way. It would still be murder in the second degree. But it didn't have to be that way. That right now as we stand here, that that young boy's skull is in an evidence locker. Because he cut it with a knife. That when this sentencing hearing is over, when all of this is over, that this family will never be able to put that boy's body in the ground, just a couple of bones that were found. That didn't need to be this way. And it didn't stop with the physical tampering, and people talked about 
how callous he was in disregarding his own 13-year-old boy that he used to hold, put him out in the woods for the animals. It didn't stop with that. He did more. We heard from experts. He did more. There was cutting. There was movement of body parts. And there was repeated lying. Now, he could have remained silent. He didn't have to say anything. But over and over and over, he continued to mislead for years, causing pain. And that body was eight miles up the road, Judge. Didn't need to be that way. When I think about the community impact, the flyers are what struck me. But in the time and in, in five years of being here and working on this case, I've heard comments by store owners. I've heard jurors. We heard jurors in a prospective pool. One of them I recall distinctly saying that her family had taken her out of town around the time of the disappearance because they were worried that there could be a child killer on the loose. This mentality of fear, this cloud that hangs over a community with a mystery like this that's unsolved. It's profound, and it didn't need to be that way. There were jurors that were too emotional, and I appreciate your honor spending over a week making sure that he had a fair and impartial jury. And it was done well, and it needed to be done that way. There were a couple of people here and there that were too emotional even to come in. There were the friends that you heard testify, Judge. Some of them aren't doing well. And a lot of them, this is still hanging over them. You can see almost a reflection of what Dylan could have been in, in some of these kids who are now 21 years old. And you can see some of them still struggling. You can hear it in their voices, how emotional they still are so many years later as they come in here and hope for justice nine years later. Regular citizens, I want the court, I would ask the court to consider what I've thought about many times, what it takes for citizens of this beautiful community to have to go out into their recreation area that they love and sift through the rocks and sticks in the woods, hoping he's a missing child, but knowing at any point in time that they could overturn a child's bone. And law enforcement, Tom Cowing and Tanya Goldbright and Jim Mazzell and the entire sheriff's office, how tirelessly they worked and how frustrating it was not to get any answers from the defendant and how much they, how deeply they cared that this was done right. And it wasn't just law enforcement, Your Honor. It was nationwide search for a child. When sentencing the defendant, Judge, I would ask you to consider this. I would ask you to consider because of his deception and lies and the things, things that he did, how many times Elaine Hall and Mike Hall and Corey Hall were called into a police station in that first seven months to look at a video of some kid walking into a grocery store or a gas station and praying, hoping, God, please let it be Dylan. He knew the whole time it wasn't Dylan. Each time they went through that. When it comes down to the question today, it's what sentence can bring justice. And I would submit to the court it's actually how close we can get to justice. Because this man right here, he doesn't have enough years left to give back what he took from Dylan. I hesitate to even call it justice. From what he put this family and community through, with what we're dealing with, what I would ask the court to consider is how close can we get to justice. Each year that you impose on him is one step further closer, as close as we can get to justice for a murder of a child. And if part of justice is restoring the balance and the harm done to the community, he doesn't have enough years to give. But each year you sentence is important. Each and every one is important for this community. What I would conclude with, Judge, is on November 18th of 2012, the defendant had a choice after he murdered Dylan, after he was guilty of this crime. The aggregating fact, the aggravating factors, he had a choice that would impact this community forever, that still impacts this community today, that impacted the family for so many months. And you know what he did? He decided to go all or nothing. He decided to go all in to do unimaginable acts to avoid the consequences in this case so that the consequences would be nothing. He went all or nothing, and now with a guilty verdict, Your Honor, the only, case, the only sentence that is justice is all of those 48 years. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Doherty? Good morning, Your Honor. 
Your Honor has presided over this case for years and sat through a five-week trial and has listened to all the remarks this morning. And I think Your Honor is about ready to impose sentence and bring justice to this case and this community. So I'm going to be very brief. I couldn't help but, in listening to the remarks from Dylan's family, think about a classroom up at the college and think that there's a seat there that's empty today that Dylan Redwine could have occupied but for this man. And when we go to lunch later today, each of us, there'll be a seat in the place we go that could have been and would have been occupied by Dylan Redwine but for this man today who sits here awaiting the sentence and justice from this court. When the defendant smashed the skull of Dylan Redwine, he obviously sent a shockwave emanating through Dylan's head and killed him. But that shockwave actually rippled further out. And the courts heard about the shockwave ripping a hole through Dylan's family that will never fill. But the sentence the court imposes, that justice, will never fill the void left in their lives. Every day they wake up thinking about Dylan. Every night they go to bed praying to Dylan. That hole will never be filled. And for Dylan's friends, as co-counsel just so powerfully described, they live with his memory either as a burden, an inspiration, or both. Because when one loses a friend, so early in life, that stays with you forever. Those friends carry with them today the memory and inspiration of Dylan, but you see the struggle that they fight through, even as they testify here, each and every one of them so bravely and so strongly. And for them and for Dylan's family, they have waited for justice all this time. And they believed in the justice system, they believed in the court, they believed in the jury, some of those jurors are here today, Your Honor. And I want to highlight for the court something that we haven't talked much about this morning, which is as that shockwave emanated out and ripped the hole through the family, the friends, and this community, there are those who run in response to the shockwave, to the harm that's been caused. And the La Plata County Sheriff's Office certainly charged towards that shockwave that this man caused when he smashed Dylan's skull so hard that he killed Dylan. There are over 1,500 unsolved homicides in the state of Colorado. This one is solved because of the work of the La Plata County Sheriff's Office. They ran towards that shockwave. In search and rescue, this community, the countless volunteers all ran towards that shockwave to do the very best they could, the very best we could, in the face of the very worst that this man could ever do. And I think that's so important for us to remember as justice is imposed today. I'd ask the court to think for a moment and to picture in your mind the dive team from New Mexico as they left their families and suited up and traveled here to search the lake, believing that they were looking for a missing and perhaps drowned boy because of this man's statements. Think about the impact on their lives. It was so many years ago. But this case has impacted so many people, including those who ran to the shockwave that the defendant caused. And the reason so many folks, the expert witnesses, law enforcement, FBI, the district attorneys from around the state, all came charging to that shockwave is the very reason the court should impose the maximum sentence of 48 years. Because this man had done the very worst that one could do, the most horrific and brutal murder of one's own child. It's why people like FBI agent Johnny Grusing came to Durango. He dropped everything he was doing in Denver and came here in the days that followed the murder committed by the defendant. And he did so in response to the calls for help, in response to the shockwave that the defendant caused. And when he met with the defendant, he said the boulder of justice will come down. Justice is going to come. Special Agent Grusing said that to this man in 2012. I stand here today before you in 2021. Every day that has passed since that conversation has been because of this man's refusal, in fact, his attempts to do everything possible to desperately avoid responsibility. But today, with the court sentence, justice will come. Throughout the trial, even today, 
Council makes remarks about different district attorney's offices uniting to prosecute this case. It's exactly what should happen in the face of the most horrific and brutal murder that one can commit. When you receive a call for assistance in a case like this, answering no is not an option. It's why the 20th Judicial District and the 1st Judicial District are here today and have been for many years. And it's why they agreed to support under the leadership and direction of District Attorney Champaign. That team came together. And as much as a testament to Mr. Champagne and to this community that people came from all around the state and all around the country to help, really that response is all about what this man did. The shockwave produced a response that one would hope for in the face of such brutality. That when someone kills a young man, a young boy like Dylan Redwine in such brutal, horrific fashion, there should be the response that we see in this case and from this community. For those of us in the justice system, we've been doing this a long time. And Your Honor has probably asked the question that each of us has asked, which is how could someone do this? How does someone do this to his own son? One might answer, I don't know, but I know the response is exactly what it should be. That this community and law enforcement responded just as they should. That law enforcement went towards that shockwave and did everything, the very best they could, to make sure this homicide would not go unsolved. And that we brought our strongest response in the face of such brutality. When we see acts of brutality, when we see a horrific murder, sometimes it's hard to answer that question of how could someone do it. We look to the response to see how we as a community exist and what we as a community stand for and what the rule of law stands for. And in this case, this response is exactly what I would hope, what we would hope, and what we as a state hope to see in the face of brutality from this man. Now that opportunity to respond, that obligation, that responsibility, lays squarely with this honorable court. The defendant had a right to a fair trial. And that's exactly what this court provided day after day after day. The defendant had a right to a fair jury. And that's what the jurors from this community, that's what this community provided every day of that five week long trial, ending with them finding him guilty of murdering his own son. The defendant had no right to destroy Dylan Redwine. And he has every right to be held full accountable. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Doherty. Mr. Champagne. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Doherty, Mr. Johnson. Your Honor, I want to speak briefly about the law that applies to the sentencing. Both convictions in this case are class two felonies. Both are subject to sentencing in the aggravated range. The child abuse statute specifically delineates in 18.1.34018B is the uh, sentencing provision um, in the statutes that indicate that twice the maximum sentence of the presumptive range uh, is available to the court in this case or 48 years. Uh, regarding murder in the second degree, that is a per se crime of violence. Uh, per the language of the statute uh, and pursuant to 18.1.3406 uh, and such uh, is up to uh, sentencing up to 48 years is available for that charge. Your Honor, the people believe that both require the full 48 years in prison. As to merger, the, the people argue that that is unnecessary in this case. The crimes of conviction in this case in both involve different elements and therefore different underlying proof. Murder in the second degree is defined as knowingly causing the death of another, while child abuse, child abuse resulting in death is knowingly or recklessly engaging in conduct that results in a child's death. The mens rea and actus reus of both are different and distinct, and one may be convicted of either crime without necessitating a conviction of the other. 
Here, the defendant was convicted of both and deserves the maximum sentence for both. These crimes are not necessarily included within one another, and they prohibit distinct conduct and define distinct and separate offenses. In my research, um, I found a case called People v. Robinson. The citation to that case is 874 P. 3rd 453. And the holding of that case indicates that first degree murder and child abuse resulting in death do not merge. And it directs the court that each offense, if each offense requires proof of a fact not required by the other offense, the offenses are sufficiently distinguishable for the purposes of double jeopardy and merger. I would ask the case to uh, the court to review that case prior to uh, reaching your final decision on the question of merger. And if the court uh, requests, the people are more than happy to supplement or brief the issue further, if that would be helpful. Given that merger remains a somewhat open question, um, although the people feel clear that it's not necessary, we believe that the safest course of action for this court to pursue is to impose the maximum sentence of 48 years for both murder in the second degree and child abuse causing death. These sentences are especially justified in the light of all the aggravating factors that people have described to the court today. But there's one last factor I want to visit. Not only did Mark Redwine commit one of the most brutal acts of violence in La Plata County history. But throughout these nine years, throughout this trial, even here today, he has shown no remorse for what he did. He has taken no responsibility whatsoever for his heinous crime. In the pre-sentence investigation report, he calls these proceedings a miscarriage of justice and a fake conviction, a sham trial. These proceedings went on for years. He was indicted in 2017. The state of Colorado provided him with the most robust defense available to him under the law. He had experts. He had years to investigate. He was given access to all the evidence he wanted, all the testing that the state could provide. He was given every ounce of due process due to him under the state of the law of Colorado. And this, your honor ensured a fair trial. For five weeks, this court gave him endless due process, endless rights, endless opportunity to make sure that this case was fairly tried, this jury was fairly picked, and this conviction was fairly achieved. And that's exactly what happened. And today, this man who continues to deny the truth of what he has done, who cowardly hides from responsibility in the face of overwhelming evidence of his guilt and the clear and convincing mandate from the jury finding him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, a man who had the chance to atone for his sins, to step up like a man and accept responsibility and to end the suffering of all involved. He stands before you, refusing to accept responsibility, showing no remorse, reflecting that same cold-hearted murderer's heart that killed Dylan Redwine. Your Honor, that's the ultimate aggravating factor that you should consider. And that alone justifies imposition of the maximum sentence in this case, 48 years for both counts. Thank you, Your Honor. I have nothing further. Thank you, Mr. Champagne. Mr. Redwine, would you stand up, please? Mr. Redwine, I'm sure your attorneys have explained to you that you retain your right to sentence, or excuse me, to silence until your sentencing is over. And that right extends to the time of any appeals that are filed. Uh, I know that you're intending to file an appeal, um, so that right is still in effect. However, you also have a right of allocution. You have the right, if you want to, to speak to the court, 
in terms of what you think this court should do in imposing sentence. Uh, you don't have to do it. I won't hold it against you if you do not. Uh, but it's your decision as to whether or not you want to uh, exercise the right to speak before I impose sentence. Do you wish to tell me anything before sentencing? No, Your Honor, I do not. Thank you. I also want to inform you that you do have a right to appeal, which I know your attorneys have been talking about. That's the form of papyrus that Mr. Uh, Moran was talking about earlier. And I will uh, sign that order as soon as I, uh, when we get out of here today. Uh, that right uh, to exercise that right of appeal, you have to file your notice of appeal within 49 days. And uh, I know both your counsel know what needs to happen. They're both experienced. I'm sure that will be taken care of. Based upon the jury verdicts in this case, I'm going to enter judgment of conviction to murder in the second degree and child abuse acting in a knowing or reckless manner resulting in death. Since this trial, and even before the trial was over with, but since the verdicts were returned, I've thought a lot about if you were convicted or then after you're convicted, what the appropriate sentence would be. There's some things that are in your favor. Right now, you're 60 years old. Don't have much, if any. I mean, your criminal history is extremely minor. And even though the jury found, and this court believes that your actions caused the death of your son, you still lost your son. And that's something that you're going to have to live with forever. And I find that to be a mitigating factor. When I uh, impose sentence, I also need to consider the fact that whatever I give you today is not going to be what you serve. You're going to be eligible for parole prior to the expiration of the term that I impose. And on top of that, uh, I expect that you'll behave similar to what you did in the jail, and uh, you'll receive earned time, which will reduce your sentence even further. There are aggravating cir circumstances in this case also. First of all, you killed. Okay. First of all, you killed your son a 13-year-old boy. At 13, he's still a little boy. As a father, it's your obligation to protect your son, to keep him from harm. And instead of that, you inflicted enough injury on him to kill him in your living room. After the passion of whatever caused you to act the way you did subsided, you didn't think about Dylan. You thought about yourself. You sanitized the crime scene, you hid Dylan's body, and you went so far as to remove his head from the rest of his body. There's only one reason to do that, and that's to try uh, and avoid, if any remains are found, or were ever found, that Dylan would ever be identified. You left his body to be scavenged by wild animals, not caring that concealing uh, Dylan's remains tremendously increased the trauma felt by this community, felt by Dylan's brothers, and felt by his mother. You continually lied about what happened, about your knowledge as to where Dylan's remains were, were hidden. You continued to lie despite the pain and trauma that that inflicted upon Dylan's brothers and his mother, Mr. Hall, and the entire community. Your actions not only removed and deprived Dylan the opportunity, the opportunity to grow into a man to be what he could have been. He's not able to get married, fall in love, have kids, and potentially have grandkids. You stole that joy from Dylan. You stole that joy from Corey and Brandon and Elaine. What they could have experienced watching Dylan uh, to grow and mature into his full potential will never be known by them and that's because of your actions. The evidence against you is overwhelming. Uh, however, in your statement to the probation department or the pre-sentence report, you wrote the following, and this is a quote from what you wrote. Innocent of all charges, miscarriage of justice, fake conviction, sham trial. So there is no misunderstanding. I am exercising all my rights to appeal the court's rulings and challenge the biased jury's decision to convict with no evidence any crime was committed. I take this circumstance very seriously 
and want to make clear that I too have lost a child I love more than life itself. I will fight for true justice, not for myself, but for Dylan. I have always shown remorse for the things that I am guilty of. Stand against fake justice, end quote. After all this time and listening to what occurred here in this trial, in this courtroom, you still take absolutely no responsibility for what you did to Dylan. I have trouble remembering a convicted criminal defendant that has shown such an utter lack of remorse for his criminal behavior. These are all aggravating factors that leads me to believe that a lenient sentence would unduly depreciate the seriousness of your crimes and that you need significant punishment. The community needs to be uh, protected from you. You need to be removed from society for a long period of time. I'm going to sentence you to 48 years on both counts with five years of parole. They are to be served concurrently. You'll receive 1,540 days of credit for time served. Deputy Robinson, you can take the defendant back to jail. Thank you. Judge, if I may. There are mandatory advisements that this court's got to make with this sentence. Mr. Moran, we're done. All right, you have an issue, you file it in writing. We'll be so, so that it's clear, we object to your objection is noted, Mr. Moran. Mr. Moran. Mr. Moran, I'm talking now. Your objection is noted. You can file it in writing. We are done. Thank you. Thank you.